Okay, <laughs> so the so talk is about uh, text to knowledge and back and issues and challenges in uh, life science. So it's, uh, this morning we had a nice talk about uh, inference and uh, about uh, bi biology challenges and this, is, will be, this will be the continuation on this subject. So as you all, 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 yes, all know, uh, one of the fundamental goals of biology is to understand the way living organisms work. And then the computer challenge for achieving that is to design formal models with uh, the, the data that are predicted by biologists with predictive and explanatory power. And the recent uh, development in molecular research, but also in bioinformatics, have generated a deluge of experimental data in many domains of biology, molecular biology uh, specifically, but not only. Uh, genetics, proteomics, etc., physiology, environment. And as a consequence, as you know, all of you, uh, many public results have been published in all these related domains. And this means that there is a lot of complex knowledge which is spread in millions of documents. And this knowledge has to, com to be combined with this, the experimental data. And this is the role of uh, information extraction to do that. But uh, to, to, to achieve this combination, some formalization is needed. And this is what it's about, uh, my talk is about uh, today. So first of all, I would like to make a distinction between uh, data, information, and knowledge. Uh, data, for me, are discrete elements, numbers, database, text. And this is different from information. Information uh, are data that have been filtered, contextualized, interpreted, and locally related to domain knowledge. So this is some kind of pieces of independent knowledge. And then at the level of knowledge, this information is organized, synthesized, and related into a unified system of formal definitions and fundamental principles. And this is done for a, a shared understanding of this knowledge and for action, obviously. And what is interesting in information extraction is to go all along this path from data to, to knowledge. So just to start with an example uh, of how information extraction can be seen as a modeling activity. Here is an example of uh, a text. No. Thank you. Yeah. So here is an example of, um, of text uh, about uh, microbiology. Bifidobacterium longum is found in newborn infant as a normal component of gut flora. And classically, this uh, information uh, is extracted in, the, um, in order to fill a form. Here we are interested in uh, bacteria, Bifidobacterium, the host. Here it's a newborn infant, and where it lives, here it's a, in the gut. And more interestingly, we can relate these uh, values of the form to an ontology. This is uh, just an extra, an example, a simple example, where we have a, a hierarchy of hosts, a hierarchy of uh, part of this host, and um, taxonomy of uh, bacteria. And this way, we can relate concept of the ontology the baby to, uh, to uh, values of the form. So baby is related to newborn, and gut is related to the spine. And uh, doing that, we can relate add a new relation here between the Bifidobacterium longworm, the bacteria of the text, uh, to the intestine with the lysine relation. Okay? So this is a classical framework for information extraction. But we can do more than uh, this uh, population of ontology with new information. What we want to do is uh, also to enrich the ontology. And this could be done in the example here by adding the newborn concept and the gut concept, if we think that they are relevant for this domain. Instead of just tagging these terms in the text, we can add them as at the conceptual level. But we could also do some inference of new knowledge from the ontology and the text information as 
different equipment uses uh, this morning, and even more discovery of new knowledge that could be uh, hypothesized from the ontology and the text information. And these are different levels of uh, using the information from the text in the combination with the ontology that comes to revise the knowledge model according to the, to the text. So in the uh, next slide, I will take uh, some example from the microbial and the biodiversity uh, domain uh, my group is working about. Uh, first of all, there is a huge amount of information on biodiversity, and more specifically on microbiology. There are a lot of public data resources not only sequence databases, as you may know, but uh, also biological sample banks with a lot of, uh, of description in free text. Um, there are also a lot of, uh, of uh, publications uh, that report about microbial biodiversity. We count more than one million public references uh, on that. And what is interesting with uh, uh, microbial biodiversity is uh, that we can uh, try to relate the, the sequence of the bacteria uh, with the property of the environment. What does it mean? That bacteria are specific to given environment, to the properties of the environment. If the environment is hot, it has acid, uh, rich in oxygen, etc. And the hypothesis is that the, the genes of this uh, bacteria uh, um, have an important role in the bacteria adaptation. And, uh, if we compare uh, the sequence of the bacteria, the genomes of this bacteria, with respect to the habitat where they live, maybe we could uh, identify the genes that are responsible for this adaptation. And this would be highly useful information for all domains where bacteria are used. It is obviously health, but not only health, uh, food, ecology, and a lot of uh, different domains. Um, and at the moment, there are millions of uh, this uh, bacteria habitat, this bacteria biota uh, description available. <coughs> so the Ontobiota project, <coughs> uh, the goal of the Ontobiota project is uh, to develop information extraction technologies on this description and to uh, map this description to um, a relevant uh, ontology called Ontobiota that would be specifically uh, uh, dedicated to microorganism uh, studies. Um, we organize uh, two, two tasks, and there will be a third task, yes, uh, next year, uh, by an share task about uh, this, uh, this goal. This is a, it's an example of uh, how difficult it could be. Uh, in this example, you can see that uh, there is a microbe called the Vibrio Train that is donated from a place which is described by a long compound now. So the difficulty here is to analyze uh, the different habitats, the farm, abalone, and water, and see how they are related to the habitat together in order to map them to the ontology. So this is not just a straightforward mapping of terms in the text to uh, Ladders of the concept of ontology, but it involves more complex uh, text mining uh, analysis. So let's come back to uh, the framework ontology population versus uh, inference. So again, the same, uh, yeah, a close example to the one we already uh, see about uh, Clostridium perfusum that has been isolated from tiny. <coughs> Ontology population here consists in adding this relation like in the existing ontology. Um, the, the extract here of the ontology is displayed here, shows that uh, intestine is a human organ, and usually uh, this human organ has uh, 37 degrees as a basal temperature. Doing ontology population, we just add these links between the bacteria name and uh, the intestine as the human organ. So here are different uh, 
synthesis of uh, the ontobiotic information management that we developed based on the uh, ontology population uh, processing. We uh, extracted uh, three mi more than three million and a half description from PubMed. We uh, normalized this description with the ontobiotic ontology and we link them uh, to uh, the bacteria, the microorganisms that were mentioned. And there are different ways to query this uh, database, either directly through uh, queries, okay, or using a semantic search engine, or using a tree map to navigate in a synchronized way between the trees of bacteria and the tree of habitat. They are organized hierarchically. Now, if we want to go one step beyond, we want would like to do some deduction with the ontology to learn more about this uh, bacteria, Clostridium bacterium. So here we could deduce that uh, if this bacteria is living in uh, intestine, and this intestine is usually at the basal temperature, then we could derive that it would be able to live at this temperature. Uh, this is something that we that is certain from, uh, from the fact. So then we can go one step further and uh, make the hypothesis that if this bacteria is able to live at 37 degrees, then it is mesophile. What does that mean? Mesophile means that uh, its gross temperature, the temperature it prefers, uh, is medium temperature. And this deduction is not certain in the sense that uh, bacteria may happen to live in one place at 37 degrees, but it may be not its favorite. But it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting to look at that. Uh, let's uh, suppose that if the bacteria X lives in a habitat Y, the temperature of which is 37 degrees, then its world temperature is 37 degrees and X is made of fire. If we apply this uh, um, inference, this clause, this rule, to the information that we extracted from the test, then for all these bacteria, we uh, learn a new phenotype that uh, we didn't have uh, before, which is a uh, naval file. And this kind of information is very important for biologists because this is this kind of phenotype uh, that helps them to um, analyze the interaction of the bacteria with its environment, and then it can be, um, uh, it can be linked to the role of the genes. So we looked at, um, we tried to evaluate how, uh, how true could, could be this, uh, this deduction. Um, and uh, so we made the assumption from this uh, rule that uh, there were uh, more than 2,000 bacteria in uh, almost 6,000 gastrointestinal fat paths, which is good. That were assumed to be uh, mesophile, and we looked at the uh, GORD database. Uh, this is the GGI reference database about uh, metagenomic and genetics uh, experiments. And uh, we found that there were only uh, 700 bacteria uh, with a gross temperature of 37, which is uh, less, um, much less than, uh, than the ones we had in the subtype reference. And 88% uh, of these bacteria uh, from on top of your top uh, database were not known in gold. Our expectation at the beginning was just to evaluate our assumption compared to gold, but finally we couldn't because there were so few information in gold that we couldn't do anything with, uh, with this uh, mesophile phenotype. So finally, our conclusion is that uh, uh, it should be. Uh, this is potentially a powerful way to complete the experimental genomic database on this kind of deduction that we do from the temperature of the habitat to the phenotype of the bacteria. So obviously, manual curation and also formal validation is uh, needed. If uh, on, in one way you derive that the bacteria is mesophile and from another habitat you deduce that the bacteria uh, need a very hot uh, habitat, uh, you may have uh, Constraint, integrity constraints uh, uh, that shows you that these uh, two uh, hypotheses are contradictory and this would help to, to validate. Uh, 
one, one step further, or one we have uh, derived the particular time, we could maybe say something about the older bacteria that are living in the same environment and about um, it may happen that uh, we do know nothing about, uh, about this bacteria. So here is another rule. If two bacteria X and Z live in the same habitat, oops, there is a mistake. Two bacteria X and Y live in the same habitat Z, and we know that X has phenotype P, but we don't know anything about bacteria Y. Maybe we could derive that uh, bacteria Y has the same phenotype as P. What does that mean? Let's see on an, an example. We have a bacteria called Acidobacteria C bacteria, which lives in acidic strata on the P. Do you know what P is? So this is known to be a very uh, acid environment. And this is also what the ontology says. So from the first rule of the previous slide, we can derive that uh, this bacteria is acidophile. Nothing new here. But let's see um, now. We have another bacteria called Proteus mirabilis. This is a normal bacteria, and it lives together with this acidobacteria C bacteria in thermic gut. We could assume by abduction that uh, thermic gut is acid. Because we know that uh, Acidobacteria C bacterium is acidophile. If it's acidophile, it should live only in acid environment. So by abduction, we suppose that the uh, thermic gut is acid, which is, which is an assumption. And then from this assumption, we could derive that the proteus mirabilis is acidophile. And by this way, we can propagate this phenotype information all over uh, the bacteria and habitat of protoxid, which is uh, very interesting because they are very few um, experiments and metagenomics and uh, samples and given habitat. If we can propagate information from uh, this habitat to uh, other habitat and other places, this is uh, a powerful way to expand the uh, database. Obviously, this is risky because uh, in, it may happen that it is not uh, acid. But uh, the, this hypothesis could be reinforced by the number of cases where we find that the uh, proteus mirabilis uh, is uh, acidophilic. And if there is a high number of converging hypotheses, this may confirm this, uh, this phenotype. OK, so I, with, through this example, I have shown you that using uh, experimental information together with uh, publication information and then inference and ontology, we can extend the knowledge we have about uh, the microbiology uh, 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 So here is another example in a completely different uh, domain. It's about uh, gene regulation network. Uh, and this example is taken from the LLL uh, corpus that uh, Kevin mentioned uh, in the introduction. This is a simple example uh, that you certainly already uh, see. About uh, interaction between protein and genes, and you know that it's, it's key knowledge in biology because uh, regulatory networks uh, are very important in the understanding of how organisms live. Um, so, from uh, the extraction of simple interaction like that, we can derive full uh, rega regulatory network from, from the head. And this is uh, important information because. Uh, Generally, this kind of interaction are not described in the databases, but uh, mainly in, uh, in papers. Um, but in fact, what uh, biologists uh, need is more complex regulation models. We really don't, do not need only just simple interactions, uh, but uh, uh, more, more specifically, uh, interaction between uh, uh, composite sites entities, as uh, was mentioned this morning, but also uh, richer relation types, so that you can distinguish between the physical binding of the protein uh, on the DNA, between the regular membership, and between the cellular mechanism, etc. Uh, and these are examples of this, uh, of this relation that we are proposing the GR arm task in bioentity. Uh, Task in, uh, in smoking. 
let's say, also need uh, the general shape of, uh, of the network, which is represented by the genetic interaction uh, with the distinction between the mechanisms and, and the effects. So, uh, knowing this uh, specific uh, level relation type, we can derive the regulation network. And in uh, microbiology, and this uh, conference is about uh, microbes again, uh, there are a lot of this description, very specific description at the molecular level, and less of this uh, general uh, description. So the idea is uh, to use uh, inference to derive the general uh, relation from the specific point. So maybe you cannot do it this Can you read it from the small thing? So uh, given uh, this relation, in, in orange between uh, protein side promoters and genes, which are very specific uh, relation on a physical um, phenomenon. Uh, we can derive an interaction between the protein and the gene of uh, binding sites. And here is an example. We show that GRE binds to two sites that span the uh, surface region of the codeine promoter. So applying information extraction to that, we track this uh, specific uh, relation, which are represented here in a more abstract way. And from that, using uh, this rule, we can infer that uh, GRE uh, interact with, uh, GRE protein interact with uh, COD-B uh, gene. So by this way, we can reconstruct 75% uh, uh, of the network. This is a network about uh, Bacillus syphilis, which is a model uh, bacteria, and it is about the sporulation phenomenon. Uh, and what is interesting here is that uh, the network is found with the uh, 75 uh, exposure, which describes uh, a lot of the type of, uh, of problem. But if we look at, um, at the detail of the network, at the label of the uh, degrees between the, the nodes, the results are much weaker. This is an uh, STR measure, which means that uh, uh, the higher score is uh, the worst. Um, so this shows that if we use uh, some uh, inference uh, from the specific relation to a general relation, finally we gain uh, an interesting result, which is this uh, shape of this network. Um, if we stay at, uh, just at the level of the relation that has been extracted from the text, the results are Okay, so I hope I have shown you that uh, uh, there is a high potential of uh, information extraction to systems biology, and we already know that uh, from the talk of, of this morning. And they are complementary of uh, experimental uh, data, but uh, by closer integration of uh, the ontology and the knowledge that is extracted from the text, we uh, can gain uh, a lot uh, of new information. But this requires uh, knowledge representation language. I have uh, shown a lot of these uh, inference uh, rules. Some of them were uh, represented in uh, logic representation, but uh, it was uh, quite vague when I presented them. And in the rest of the talk, I will say uh, more about uh, the language that we could use uh, to, to do that. So here's a general uh, figures about uh, uh, how the information from the text, from the image, from the database uh, could be uh, combined for uh, other needs, like uh, building uh, dynamic models for systems biology. So the idea here is that uh, each of uh, these information source has its own uh, knowledge model, and they are all different. The one you need uh, to uh, extract knowledge from the text is different from the one you need to for extracting information from the image. And it's again usually different from uh, the data schema that allow you to uh, query the database. And uh, uh, going from one to another is not that, that easy, and we need uh, some uh, way to convert the representation from uh, a base to another base.
with respect to information extraction, uh, to go from the data, from the text, to uh, knowledge inference, we need different types of languages. We need annotation language for the manual annotation, which is in general different from the language that we use for automatic information extraction from the, from the uh, reference corpus or for predicting this uh, information. The language that we need for information management, one, once we have performed the extraction and we store the results in the database, we use another query language. Um, and finally, to uh, do some uh, knowledge inference, to prediction of new knowledge, uh, we need another uh, ontology language. And all these languages all along the line should be compatible. And that's not that easy to convert the text knowledge uh, all along the process. So to illustrate uh, the idea, I will take an example from uh, another project um, which we are developing in my group about several reading. We were involved in uh, a project called Sambley with uh, many French seed companies, uh, including Lumadra, which is a, a small uh, seed company. Uh, you may know that uh, it's a long and costly uh, process to design new varieties uh, of seeds. seeds uh, uh, you need a field experiment and genotyping and phenotyping. And it's, uh, it's very long and costly, and at the same time, it's very important to try to develop new seeds that resist to disease or that require uh, less water than. Uh, and there is a lot of published results on previous experiments, but they are largely underexploited because they are in free text and they don't want to company because it's hard to for extracting the information from this text. Um, so the Sambley project was both about uh, new genotyping and phenotyping experiments and uh, information extraction from the text. And uh, the kind of information that we wanted to extract is information about markers. Markers are uh, close to genes and chromosomes. And what is interesting uh, is that generally, uh, when uh, I'll say it another way, <laughs> uh, gene controls the tray, the characteristics of the, of the seeds, but uh, they may be hard to uh, identify and a variety to find exactly uh, where is the gene and if it's, it's controlled or not the given tray and it's easier to detect markers. So usually seed companies use this, uh, this marker to assist the selection of uh, new varieties. So um, to, to, uh, to do this uh, information extraction, as usually uh, we annotate um, text about uh, this relationship between markers, genes, and traits, and phenotypes, and varieties. Uh, using uh, the Alice AA annotation editor. And as a uh, general annotation editor, uh, it allows to uh, annotate type entities and any relation between the entities, so the rules, relations of relations, and also, I think it's uh, less common, sets of entities and relations, which means an order. And obviously, also, uh, it's a bit highly falling thing, the entities and the events uh, together in the display of the screen of uh, Adizae with two parts, the text here with annotation and uh, representation in a tabular form. So this is one language. And um, more formally, yeah, it is, re it is represented here by uh, on an example of uh, gene expresses phenotype in variety. It's a ternary relation that relates uh, the color disappears of this it was in green. Uh, resistance to the value MSV, which is a virus um, in a given variety, CO blah blah. Uh, and here we have the name of the, of the gene. So here the gene expresses the phenotype resistance to the value MSV in this variety, which is represented in a more formal way here. 
and behind in Adisae, we have a schema that defines this gallery relation with the role of uh, the arguments and uh, the types of the arguments, these kilobytes and value key. The role are respectively advent, object, and condition. And this instance is represented uh, by constant and the surface form uh, of its uh, uh, occurrences uh, in the text. So this is uh, very classical. But the corpus annotation language is slightly different. Here we use a uh, bio NLP share type representation, uh, where the relations are represented by uh, events. Um, again, we have uh, the roles of agent, object, and condition. Um, we have the types of the, the arguments and uh, the surface form. It is close enough that we can derive uh, this representation from uh, the surface form. It's close enough for event representation, but it's different for other types of uh, objects. For instance, sets are not easily represented in uh, BioNLP. Um, we have to extend also BioNLP shared time representation to uh, represent uh, discontinuous entities, which was not uh, initially known for that. If we want to represent this uh, information into an uh, RDF tree form, we had to uh, map this NRA representation to a binary representation. Uh, probably you all know that. I'm not sure I have to, to say a lot uh, about it. This is done by creating an additional artificial variable that allows to link each of the arguments of the binary relation to the events which is represented by this new variable. Uh, and again, obviously, we have to link this information to uh, the types and the surface uh, forms. And this is not as straightforward as the, as to map this primary relation into a binary relation. Uh, I will show you an example uh, later of the kind of problem we, we could we can have. Then uh, transformation to a relational database is straightforward if we keep this uh, binary representation. Uh, if we uh, use a uh, binary representation, we have to leave either uh, the types or the roles. We cannot keep both of them. Uh, in this example, we take uh, the types, variety, gene, and phenotype, and the agent conditions and object have to be left. Uh, this is a uh, uh, represent the different tools uh, that uh, we uh, use uh, for uh, exploiting using this uh, information extracted from the text. So we have a database where we integrate both the experimental data from uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, experiments from these uh, seed companies, the information that has been extracted from the text. We can do a query in the same uh, interface. Again, we have a semantic search engine, you know, a bibliographic search engine. There are more than 3,000 full papers annotated uh, uh, there. And we had to develop uh, a new ontology called Read Phenotype Ontology. This is dedicated uh, to read, especially uh, read diseases. There is also all cells. There is a lot of different diseases, and uh, there is no, uh, there were no ontologies at this time uh, for open data. It is available on AgroPortal. AgroPortal is a new uh, kind of bio portal uh, maintained in Montpellier uh, in France, uh, dedicated to uh, agronomic agricultural information. Yeah, I, I said I, I will show you uh, a more complex uh, example. It's an example about uh, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a modern plant. Um, the focus here was uh, to uh, construct a model of seed storage, reserve, and maturation. Um, the 
the idea is, is to study how uh, the seed uh, builds this, uh, this reserve and what kind of uh, uh, molecular and physiological mechanism is behind. And it's very complex. Uh, not only in our habitat, our habitat Italiana, but uh, in general. This is just uh, an example of, uh, of the complexity of, uh, at multi-scale uh, level. This work has been done in a project called uh, EMSV, it's a new institute on uh, uh, life science uh, modeling. So we had to uh, define uh, many different SD types to capture this information, uh, not only uh, DNA type, the gene, gene family, uh, box, etc., and DNA product. Common, protein family, complex domain, etc., but also process, uh, pathways, and the regulatory network, and the conditions, uh, species and genotypes, and the cell tissues and organs, and also the growth stage. So obviously, the regulation uh, depends, the type of regulation depends on the, on the stage of growth, of the development stage. And we take, took into account, obviously, also the external factors, that, uh, such as uh, stress. There were a lot of uh, many uh, LRA relation uh, type in this group. We counted uh, 160 different ones because uh, we had to take into account not only uh, high level relation, <coughs> but also modality, speculation, negation, etc., <coughs> and hierarchies of relation, as uh, as we showed this morning. Presence, increase, decrease, involvement, activation, evolution, requirement. This makes the, the whole set of relation uh, growing. And here is the representation uh, of, the, of the, the relation type, and only the one which are possible. So we remove the one which are in, incompatible with the type of the entities. So it's very big. So for manual annotation, it was just not, it was too much, <laughs> too many, too many relations. So we had to find a way to reduce the number of relations without losing information. So what we did is to select uh, 12 high-level relations by uh, merging uh, some of these relations uh, in a new relation <coughs> called condition. And uh, modalities and relation restrictions were assigned a part of the relation. So that uh, the biologist and the Editor screen just have to select among um, <coughs> 10 of these relations and not only and not among uh, 160 of these relations. But then to rewrite uh, the results of the manual annotation into a <coughs> bio NLP ST representation, uh, it was not that uh, straightforward. Uh, we had to um, map the general relation specific relation according to the entity type, and uh, we had also to add the modalities uh, as regular arguments. And in this sense, uh, we lose some information because uh, modalities like speculation or negation should not be considered as a regular argument of the relation. They do not play the same role as a gene or protein. But uh, in this kind of representation, by like share task or relational database, etc. Was straightforward to do it is to consider them as regular arguments. So it would be better to find a more subtle way to, to represent it. Just some time. <laughs> so the, the idea through this uh, different project and illustration is uh, to say that uh, the contribution on, of information extraction to life science research can go far beyond ontology population and database of things. And in particular, system biology uh, today deals with explanatory and predictive knowledge models from data. And this is a very nice opportunity for uh, information extraction to contribute <coughs> to knowledge modeling and discovery. And not only by just providing facts, but uh, by a more closer interaction with uh, 
the ontology and this model and so uh, that um, this information could be uh, propagated and generalized uh, uh, with the ontology. But this requires a consistent representation for all the processing steps from uh, the text, manualization, to the knowledge model. And it raises many theoretical and practical issues. I just gave some examples here, but there 